James. Okay, thanks, Austin. <clears throat> so just to give everybody a little roadmap of what we're going to be going over today, um, we'll start with the arrangement of 101 rejections at the USPTO. That's kind of looking at where they fall and um, which uh, technology centers and art units receive the highest proportion of 101 rejections. Then we'll look at how applicants respond to them and how successful those responses are. And then we'll kind of talk about what this means um, in the bigger scheme of things and what it might mean for your practice. And then I'm going to hand it over for Aubrey in the last part um, to talk about some Juristat tools and maybe how you can use some of these to uh, improve your prosecution practice. So let's go ahead and get started. So this is the timeline we're working with. Um, Bilski came out, was in 2010, Mayo was in 2012, Myriad was 2013, and finally Alice was in 2014. Um, so we'll do a brief recap of these cases just to jog your memory in case you might have gotten a little bit rusty. Um, so as you all know, there's no patents on laws of nature, natural phenomena, and abstract ideas. Those are exceptions to Section 101. Um, so the Bilski case was uh, concerned process claims generally. Before Bilski, the main legal test for determining whether a process was patent eligible subject matter was the machine or transformation test, which basically held that a process was patent eligible under Section 101 if it was either implemented by a particular machine or it transformed an article from one state into another. The court in Bilski held that the machine or transformation test is not the sole test for determining what constitutes patentable subject matter. But it did say that it was an important clue for determining 101 issues. Um, they didn't elaborate another test, though, so that kind of left the door open. Um, Mayo and Myriad concerned laws of nature and natural phenomena. Um, they were concerned, uh, excuse me, in Mayo, the court held that the claims at issue uh, just described a relationship that existed in nature, so it fell under the laws of nature exception. After that, the USPTO issued guidance to the examiners with a new three-step analysis that examiners were to use to ascertain whether a process claim is patentable. So in that guidance, it had three steps. First, uh, you would ask, is the claimed invention directed to a process defined as an act or a series of acts or steps? If yes, then the second part is, does the claim focus on the use of the law of nature, uh, a natural phenomenon, or a naturally occurring relation? Um, and if the answer to that is also yes, then you move on to the third uh, prong of the test uh, where you ask, does the claim include additional elements or steps such that the natural principle is practically applied and the claim amounts to significantly more than the natural principle itself? Uh, and if no, if the answer is no, um, the claim is not patent eligible. So that was kind of the landscape uh, that the Alice case came out against. Um, Alice concerned abstract idea claims, specifically uh, computer implemented claims. Um, and so in Alice, the court basically took that USPTO guidance that was issued after Mayo and reduced it to two steps. Um, so basically it said, are the claims at issue, the first step is, are the claims at issue directed to a patent ineligible concept? And two, if so, is there an element or combination of elements in the claim sufficient to ensure that the patent in practice amounts to significantly more than the ineligible concept itself? Um, they did not describe uh, what significantly more really meant, so a lot of people consider this decision to be vague and not uh, terribly helpful. Um, many argue that this string of 101 cases, starting with Bilski and ending in Alice, um, especially Alice, has produced a vague and unworkable legal landscape around computer-implemented inventions, particularly at the USPTO, because examiners are basically just issuing 101 rejections left and right because they don't really know how to apply the new law. So that's what people say, but is that really true? Um, there's definitely a bit of truth to it uh, when looking at the concentration of 101 rejections issued across the USPTO. Before Bilski, 101 rejections only made up about 8.5% of all rejections issued at the USPTO, which made it the least frequently cited rejection basis. After Alice, that percentage jumped to 12.2%, which now makes 101 rejections the second least frequently cited rejection basis after 112A. Um, so this is a 44% increase, and that's quite a big impact just after four years, uh, four cases in the span of four years. Um, so today, going forward, we're going to look at all of our data in this context. We'll show pre-Bilski numbers and then post-Alice numbers, just kind of give you an idea of what was going on 
before this recent string of 101 jurisprudence and what's going on now after it. So a rejection, a 101 rejection is overcome if the next office action is either a notice of allowance or another rejection that does not cite the same rejection basis as the previous office action. So for example, let's assume that an applicant receives a final rejection that cites sections 101 and 103. The applicant responds with an RCE and the next rejection only cites 103. In that case, we would assume that the RCE was successful at overcoming the 101 rejection since it was not raised again uh, in the subsequent rejection. So in the case of 101 rejections, um, that percentage has dropped from 72.5% before Bilski to 53.3% after Alice, um, which means that before Bilski, 72.5% of applicants were successfully able to overcome a 101 rejection, and now that's dropped. Um, so a lot fewer applicants are getting over these rejections than they used to. Um, as you might expect, though, these 101 rejections aren't distributed evenly through the USPTO. Um, instead, they, they tend to cluster into a handful of tech centers and art unit groups. So looking at the distribution of 101 rejections and kind of where they fall on a tech center level, uh, you'll notice that most of the tech centers here in these graphs are grayed out. That's because I want to highlight what's going on specifically in the 1600s, 3600s, and 3700s. Before Bilski, so that's the graph on the left, those three tech centers combined received about 50% of the 101 rejections at the USPTO. After Alice, that number shoots up to 70%. So if you look at the difference between the two graphs, it looks like these three tech centers are gobbling up all of the 101 rejections at the USPTO. Um, and that's because they are. Um, as you can see, tech centers 1600 and 3600 have been affected most by this increase. Um, these are all the tech centers at the USPTO starting at 1600 for the left and going chronologically up to 3700 on the right end. Um, tech center 1600 went from 5.2% 101 rejections before Bilski to 14.7% 101 rejections after Alice, which is a 182% increase. Uh, similarly, Tech Center 3600 went from 15.7% before Bilski to 32.1% after Alice, which is a 104% increase. Um, and curiously, most of the other Tech Centers actually saw their percentage of 101 rejections decrease. Um, so we're seeing fewer 101 rejections in most of the other Tech Centers, but drastically more in the 1600s, 3600s, and 3700s. So like I said, it they're really, they really are just kind of gobbling up all of these 101 rejections. Um, so now looking at the art unit group level, uh, things become even more dramatic, if you can believe it. Uh, the 101 rejection rate in the e-commerce art units, right there are the three on the left, the 3620s, 3680s, and the 3690s, shot up from around the 30% mark before Bilski uh, to around the 85 to 95% mark after Alice. That's a extremely significant jump. The remaining tech work groups here have also seen their 101 rejection rates rise by about 200 to 300%, although they make up a much smaller proportion of total rejections than in the e-commerce art units. So if you're working in one of these work groups, um, particularly, particularly the e-commerce work groups, you're basically almost guaranteed to receive a 101 rejection, and it's probably going to cite Alice. Uh, there's a diverse uh, range of technologies that are represented by these work groups. Um, as you can see, uh, uh, the e-commerce and business methods are right there at the top. Um, cryptography and security are also in there. Um, and there's also microbiology, immunology, and molecular biology, which are um, affected by the Mayo and Myriad decisions. So that's kind of where you see uh, all these 101 rejections falling if you just look at the types of technologies that are represented. Um, so now we'll take a look at how applicants respond in the post Alice, in the pre Bilski and the post Alice era. Um, there's several ways to respond to a rejection, as you know, uh, most notably an RCE or an interview or an appeal. So anecdotally, we know that RCEs are a very common way to respond to rejections, while appeals are much less common due to the time and expense involved, especially if the appeal goes to the PTAB. So what we wanted to know was the exact breakdown of how applicants have responded specifically to 101 rejections, both before 
Bilski and after Alice. Um, because amendments and RCEs go hand in hand, we, we did not consider an amendment to be a distinct response to a final rejection. So we calculated how applicants responded, whether or not that response also included an amendment. Uh, for applications in which there were multiple responses, for example, an RCE and an interview, we didn't determine the chronological order of those responses, uh, but just that each response was made at some point to the rejection prior to a subsequent rejection for an allowance. So this is the frequency of applicant responses. Um, basically what this means is when an, app, when an applicant gets a 101 rejection, uh, looking at RCE is on the left, the blue column, 56.6% of them choose an RCE. 20% choose an appeal, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so RCEs, like we said, anecdotally, we know they're very popular and the data seems to support that here. Um, there were a lot of RCEs before Bilski and there are a lot of RCEs after Alice. Um, in fact, the percentage actually went quite a ways up and appeals have actually gone down uh, since Alice, which we found to be somewhat interesting. Another uh, data point that popped out at us is that the abandonment rate has gone down as well. It was 23.2% before Bilski, and it dropped to 17.2% after Alice. Um, we, we were kind of expecting that number to go up, but um, this is what the data says. Uh, fewer people are, are abandoning their, their applications after getting 101 rejections, surprisingly. Um, so we also wanted to know how successful those responses typically are overcoming 101 rejections. So after we calculated the frequency of the various types of applicant responses, we determined how successful those responses were in overcoming the rejection for during the two different periods. So for this study, we narrowed the results from the Juristat database to instances where the action, the highlighted response in question, such as an RCE or an interview, was the only response to that rejection. So for example, going forward, um, if we say that an RCE was successful at overcoming a 101 rejection 20% of the time, we got that figure from applications where an RCE was the only response to the 101 rejection. Focusing on specific responses like this allows us to distill down the effectiveness of each type of response and look at it in isolation um, in a way where it'll be unaffected by other responses that could also be influencing the outcome. So if there's an RCE and an appeal, um, you know, the, the, the appeal could have overcome the rejection rather than the RCE. So we only wanted to look at cases where there was a single response so we could really see how well they work on their own. Um, so this is what it looks like. Um, when we, like we said, when we say effectiveness, we mean the same thing we do when we say overcome. It means that the next office action is either a notice of allowance or another rejection that does not cite the same rejection basis as the previous office action. Um, so Bilski, Mayo, Myriad, and Alice have all taken their toll on the effectiveness of applicants' ability to overcome 101 rejections as the success rates went down across the board for every type of response. Um, RCEs are the most common applicant response, as we found, but they're not terribly successful in the post-ALICE era with only a 41.1% effective rate. Before Bilski, an interview paired with an RCE was the most successful way to overcome a 101 rejection. That had, it was a very respectable 72.8% 70, effective rate. Um, so looking in the post-ALICE era um, at effective rates, it seems like the most effective strategy now to overcome a one-on-one -on -one rejection uh, is now just an interview, which has an effective rate of 61%. It's not terribly high, but it's definitely higher than all the others. So what does all this mean for you? Um, when we looked at the frequency of applicant responses versus the successfulness of those responses, we noticed that there were some lopsided results. For example, uh, there are not very many applicants who chose interviews despite their being successful over half the time. So only 15% of applicants who got a 101 rejection interviewed their examiner despite 61%, despite an interview being successful at overcoming a 101 rejection in 61% of cases. Um, and now the opposite was true for RCEs. 64% of applicants chose an RCE despite them being successful only 41% of the time. I mean, looking at appeals, um, not very many people chose appeals at only 8%, which typically follows what we see uh, 
looking at any type of rejection appeals just aren't super popular. Um, but they have about the same effective rate as an RCE in this case. Um, so it's not quite as lopsided because, you know, not as many people are choosing it. Um, so that brings us to the Juristat prosecution tools. Um, so we'll take a look at some hands-on technologies, and now I'm going to uh, hand it over to Aubrey to talk to you about some, some Juristat tools. Thanks, James. Good afternoon, everyone. I do want to spend just a little bit of time while um, we have you here today discussing Juristat's prosecution tools and how you can use these tools in your day-to-day -day practice to overcome 101 rejections like James has been talking about. He's given you a lot of good high-level information and in how these 101 rejections are being used and responded to at the USPTO. But I want to take it just a step further, go more specific, and discuss how you can use analytic tools uh, like we have here at Juristat to make these decisions um, in more of a specific day-to-day -day, um, decision-making process rather than just the overall statistics and analytics. So the first thing I want to talk about before we even move on to responding to 101 rejections is the ability to avoid a 101 rejection. So here at Juristat, we always like to joke that the best way to overcome a 101 rejection or the best way to overcome an Alice rejection is to just avoid that rejection in the first place. I mean, we've spoken with a lot of our clients about the effects of continuation or the effects of filing a continuation in part, um, kind of in a strategic manner to avoid the examiner who is likely to issue those 101 rejections or even avoid the art unit that is being heavily affected by those 101 rejections, art units that are more prone to issue those rejections. So any Jurisat examiner report that you pull up, and just a quick side note, this is actual data from a Jurisat examiner report for an examiner who practices in um, Tech Center 3600. So I don't know the exact art unit, but I do know that he's in the 3600s. So here you can see that these reports give you an idea of the likelihood of changing examiner or changing your art unit when you're filing a continuation or a CIP. So going back to that, if you just never get the 101 rejection in the first place, you're never going to have to overcome that difficult rejection. Uh, this gives you that information on your likelihood. So here for the particular examiner we're looking at, it's about a 12% chance of getting a new examiner and just shy of a 6%, so just above a 5% chance of getting a new art unit if you file a continuation. However, if you file a CIP, it is a better probability of getting a new examiner at 40%, and a higher probability of getting a new art unit at 29%, but still not overly high. But again, this is actual data from a Jurisat examiner report for a specific examiner in the 3600s. Each report that you look at is gonna have different information. I've looked at some of these reports before, and seeing that uh, after filing a CIP, the probability of changing examiners is uh, upwards of 50%. So you've got some good odds there. Uh, that's something that I would definitely take into consideration when you are uh, trying to avoid these 101 rejections. Well, let's jump in here real quick. Uh, Derek Setner had a good point. He says you don't really choose an RCE. Generally, you're forced into file one after receiving a final rejection. Um, if you don't want to file an appeal or an abandon at that, pay or at that point. Um, so you might also have to file an RCE and interview the case. I thought that was a good point, so I thought I'd throw it in. Awesome. Thanks, Austin. Thanks, Derek. Um, I'm going to now discuss office action response success rates. Again, this is all information from a Juristat examiner report, so you can see here that uh, we're comparing interviews to RCEs. This ties in a little bit to Austin's comment right there about the um, effectiveness of each of these office action responses. Here you can see kind of in line of what James was discussing earlier that an interview has a little bit more favorable towards the applicant success rate. There's about a 38% uh, favorable for the applicant after an interview, whereas it's 36% for the art unit as a whole. Both of those are a little bit um, low, but still better than the RCE success rate at 17% for the examiner and 21% for the RCE. So that's something that I always just like to highlight just because it does go in line specifically with what James was discussing earlier about how adding an interview into your uh, prosecution history on a particular application might prove to be uh, very effective. 
tying it in with this next slide, it's just showing some of that same information. So maybe you are kind of forced into an RCE as we were just discussing, but you are able to hopefully interview when you're filing that RCE as well, or kind of in conjunction with or soon thereafter that RCE. So you can see here that the effects of an interview on allowance rate um, for these 101 rejections and for this specific examiner in a 101 heavy art unit um, is, is pretty substantial. So you can see the examiner's overall all allowance rate is 46%, the art unit is 56%. And then if you choose to interview at any time during that prosecution history, the allowance rate jumps up to 70% for the examiner and up to 78% for the art unit. So that's a much better, uh, much prettier allowance rate that I like to see on these examiner reports. Um, and that's just by adding in an interview at any point during the prosecution um, of that particular application. And I know I keep focusing on that this is more specific information than James was discussing earlier. And that's because each um, application is handled differently. Each application is different. Each examiner reviewing the application is different. Each art unit, each tech center, these are all very different um, areas of the PTO and the practices could look a little different between uh, or depending on which examiner you're in front of or which art unit you're in. So while it's interesting to see the overall trends at the PTI, I always like to suggest that you take a look at the particular examiner you're in front of, or you take a look at the prosecution history in uh, the framework of the corporation that you're doing work for or in the framework of your particular firm. It does help to get some more insights as to what's going on. Uh, the red line at the very bottom is the allowance rate without interview. So it's even worse than the overall allowance rate. If you're not interviewing at some point in the prosecution of the application, um, you're actually hurting yourself in front of this examiner. Again, it's an individual examiner, so take that with a grain of salt. But for this examiner, if I pulled up this Juristat examiner report, I would definitely try to interview. Another bit of information on these reports that is very uh, informative and interesting when dealing with 101 rejections is the PTAB outcomes. So here you can see that more than half of the time, 61% of the time, uh, the green chunk there, the examiner's being reversed at the PTAB. Uh, the red and the yellow chunks are examiner affirmed and examiner affirmed in part, which still makes up less than half of the circle. So, uh, this would lead me to believe that maybe an appeal is a good step at some point in the prosecution of the application uh, assigned to this examiner. I would seriously consider appealing even with the added cost and time. Also, uh, something I always like to point out is that this information is really beneficial not only to you in making your decisions of how you want to proceed in particular or in front of a particular examiner, but it also gives you some hard data to rely on when discussing with colleagues or um, your client, if you need to go back to them and say, I know that it's more expensive to file an appeal, and I know that it takes more time, and it's going to extend our prosecution timeline out, but uh, look at our odds here. It's, it's pretty likely that the examiner will be reversed. I think we're right. I'm going to dig my heels in, and let's, let's make a play for this appeal. We also have on the examiner reports the ability to review office actions and responses. So essentially what this does is just give you the ability to filter through all of the 101 rejections that this particular examiner has given before you. So their historic 101 rejection um, kind of docket, what it looks like. So you can filter by 101, which is here on the left-hand side of the page, and then you can filter by what type of response you are thinking of filing. Are you going to amend? Are you kind of forced into that RCE like we were talking about before? And you can filter by in a way, so a notice of allowance. And then you can use that middle document to mine it for a uh, winning argument strategy or to avoid uh, kind of more failing argument strategies. Do what the previous applicants did that was right and avoid what they did that was uh, wrong. So that, that's a really good way to be able to understand the examiner that you're in front of. Maybe he or she has some language from one of these 101 rejection cases that they tend to rely on. Uh, you can know that beforehand to be able to anticipate the rejections and understand how you specifically should respond. I want to take just about five minutes here at the end to discuss Juristat Business Intelligence Tools. We spent a lot of time talking about how you can improve your uh, responses to 101 rejections. And once you've gotten to a place where you are improving, you are overcoming these 101s, your allowance rate overall is increasing. It's taking fewer office actions to reach disposition, um, so forth and so on. You're going to want to use that to your advantage. Um, and these Juristat Business Intelligence Tools allow you to do just that. 
they allow you to pull up information for both firms and corporations. So here on the firm side of things, uh, you can see that we've selected a example firm, your firm, and it shows the filed and disposed apps for that firm, as well as the overall allowance rate, months to disposition, and office actions. This allows you to go into any corporations or any entities that you're doing work with, or any entities that you hope to do work with, and show them how well you're doing. So as you can see on the bottom of the slide here, we have filtered this information to just show a certain number of art units, art units that are 101 heavy. And we are now putting ourselves in comparison with Acme Company and how they're doing on whole, as well as how the firms that they currently use are performing. And as you can see, my allowance rate of 74-ish is better than a couple of the allowance rates of their current firm. So better than firm C, better than firm D, better than firm F. Um, and kind of on par with firm B. So what you're going to do here is go into Acme and tell them we're moving quickly, quick, quicker. Oh my goodness, I'm sorry. <laughs> we are moving quicker than uh, your other firms to reach disposition. It's taking us fewer office actions and our allowance rates higher. We can save you time and money. We can overcome those 101 rejections. I have the hard data here to prove that. Um, and hopefully that'll help you win new business. You can also look at it on the assignee side. So we have a lot of um, in-house teams who use our tools to monitor the firms that they use for outside counsel. So you would just type in your company's name and it, again, we have it filtered to those 101 heavy art units and it will show you the firms where you're sending um, the work in that art unit or in that group of art units or in the tech center that you've selected and it will show you how well they're doing. So here, just a quick glance, I see that firm F at the very bottom of the page has a much higher allowance rate than any of my other firms, but I'm sending them the least amount of work. Um, obviously, a lot of factors go into that. Maybe I'm sending them easier applications. Uh, maybe it's because they weren't overwhelmed. Firm A just might be overburdened with the 1,300 apps that I've sent them. But all of that gives me some good insight. Maybe I should shift some apps away from Firm A um, so they're not, no longer as overburdened and give them to Firm F, give them a chance to prove that they can maintain that high allowance rate and that quick time to disposition. These tools really do allow you to get some insights into your firms or if you are a firm into your firm and any different corporations or entities that you want to learn about either to pursue them for work or from the assignee side to monitor the outside counsel that you're using. And that is all I have for today. Um, we have a little bit of time left for discussion and questions if anyone has any more. I'm not sure if Austin had any come through the chat while I was speaking. Uh, answer them all privately. So if anyone has a follow-up, feel free to ask it. Um, while we're waiting on questions, I want to go ahead and do a selfish plug here. We have a program going on called Juristat University, and it's all webinars, pretty similar to this. A lot of this data came from that, actually. Um, and you can sign up for those. They're free, and they're based on particular technology areas. Just go to juristat.university, and um, you'll see that we have an e-commerce course, although that just finished. Uh, we're going to do electrical engineering, chemical engineering, um, and well, I'm going to brand, oh, pharma and bio or life sciences. So you can sign up for those things and there's four webinars each all on different topics. And there should be a follow-up email after this uh, discussion that we're having today, which will include a link to that Juristat University information, as well as a link to view the uh, webinar that we've had just today, just conclude. Um, and at that time, you can always get any questions that you didn't think to answer or to ask in the chat box today. You can get those questions answered via email as well. So I'm actually not seeing any follow-up questions at this point. Um, we'll stay on for another minute or two if anyone thinks of anything. But other than that, thanks so much for joining us, and uh, we'll be in touch soon. Appreciate it. Here we go.
So, so Karen, I see your question. How do you look for stats for firms that don't allow publication? We have a couple different things that we do there. Um, all of our information a lot, uh, that we present to our customers is public data. So it is all pulled from published applications. But if someone is interested in providing us with their private payer um, key, we can always upload their information into our system for your uh, personal use, but it's not gonna give it across the board to all other uh, entities viewing. James, Go ahead. Uh, it looks like there's one that I think you can answer here. Are your stats broken down by rejection types, 101, 102, 103? That's similar to your article series. So. Yeah, um, we've done a couple of articles. Um, there's two that are on IP Watchdog right now that's kind of this information. Um, one's for 103 rejections and another one's for 101 rejections, which was the basis of this webinar. And then there should be another one coming out soon, next week maybe. Um, about 102 rejections. So we're gonna, I guess we're gonna keep doing this until we go through all the different cut types. So right now that would just leave 112 A and B. But uh, yeah, you can find this information for different types of rejections on IP Watchdog. And if you are interested, feel free to shoot us an email, uh, just respond to our follow-up email and we'll give you links to those articles if you have some trouble finding them as well. It looks like Philip, Philip, um, either one, has a question It says, I've heard people changing the abstract and claims and a continuation in order to change the tech center. Uh, what is our advice on this? Is it effective? Uh, no explicit advice on this, but it does happen. So our examiner reports, which you can, you can log in and try for free, will actually tell you for that particular examiner, your chance of either switching examiners or our unit based on filing continuation or continuation in part. Um, so you can actually see how effective it will be for your particular situation. Um, so we do know, we have heard of customers using it in that way, and it is possible to do, but no explicit advice on whether or not that's, you know, a good strategy or not. Okay. It looks like we ran dry. Um, please email us if you think of anything else, and if not, we will be in touch with our own email. Thanks so much.